rather le red leather journal from his desk drawer and sketched a girl sleeping in a city. Every night when you sleep, you dream in the world of shallow dreams. He drew a trail like a tether from her down into a forest land. But there's a shared dream world as well for the dreamer's most faithful. That world is called Oneros and exists in perpetuity, perpetuity, watched over by the dreamer. The soul of the dreamer's most devout can enter Oneros, bound to their bodies by a slender cord. I was bound by a thousand ropes in those days, paying, paying tithes to the tunnel enforcers and turning over most of my earnings to the gangs hunting for crumbs to feed myself and my half-brothers and sisters, enduring the cruel scrape of my mother's nails as she stared through me and begged me to bring her another wad of lullaby resin to let her sink into dreamless sleep. I can take you to Oneros if you like. Has pulled two vi vials from his laboratory, stand and held one out to me, the world of your dreams. I considered all the ropes that bound me to this world, but it was my dreams that decided for me. Perhaps Oneros could make them feel more real. Perhaps in Oneros I could find a way to make them so. I took the vial. One minute I was sitting in Essa's study, and the next I was tucked away like the lurch of sudden sleep. Sunlight surrounded me, golden liquid sunlight dripping down my skin. To a girl from the tunnels, that sunlight I'd rarely glimpsed in the real world convinced me I'd do whatever it took to make this my life. I ran first, sprinting across the vivid jade grass over flowers that twinkled as though their petals were made of jewels. But my feet were weightless, I stretched my legs and leaped in great bounds until I was flying arms wide, soaring into the fresh air, clean air, a vast quilted land unfolded beneath me, fields and forests and whitewashed stone cottages, mountains loomed in the distance, and in a valley to my right spread a city with the central spire. Trailing behind me, more felt than seen, was that golden tether from Ez's sketch, but this rope didn't try to restrain me. It only kept me whole. As I flew toward the spire in the sparkling city, I recognized the two golden posts at its crown, thrust skyward. They represented the dreamer's embrace, guiding his faithful toward their dreams. I landed atop the crown, and as I scanned the beautiful world around me, tears stung my eyes. For the first time in my life, my dreams seemed within reach. In a soft gust of air, Professor Hess landed beside me. What do you think, Livia? He asked. I blinked away the tears as I turned to answer him. I think I like it better than the real world. Hess smiled, but it looked forced. So do I. We entered Oneros rarely at first. Hess taught me how to navigate it only after all my work was done and we were sure my gang masters wouldn't find out. But I hungered for the dream world with an ache that deadened everything around me, and as was only too happy to indulge my pleading for another journey. While the dust thickened along the university's baseboards, the floors dulled with grime. At the end of each trip, two on arrows, I hurried back to the tunnel entrance. Too many chores left undone. Thin tendrils of sunlight were already stretching across his office windows. In a panic, I grabbed my cleaning rags. I'd be punished by the gang, Lieutenant. If I wasn't at the tunnel entrance before sunrise, just as I was about to hurtle out of S's office, though I was stopped short by the sharp sounds of an argument in the next room, but you said yourself she isn't ready. I don't think it's worth upsetting the gangs over the little, one little tunneler. She's clumsy and careless, I admit, stunted by life in the tunnels. But she's learning. 
She's not ready yet, but she's the best prospect I have. I heard Professor S say, I can't keep her from her duties to the gang much longer. Someone's bound to complain. We have to choose now. My breath ached in my lungs. Clumsy, careless, stunted, as it always showed me nothing but kindness. I don't suppose you could hire her directly from them. Give you more time to see whether she's really suited to our work. The other voice asked, We can't give her this kind of power over the sleeping. If there's a chance we can lose her back to the gangs. No, if we ascribe too much value to her, it'll attract the gang leader's interest. I prefer we give her temporary papers, purchase her outright, and if she demonstrates her worth, then maybe when she's older we can grant her freedom. As said, if she demonstrates her worth, the other man echoed. I spun away from the door, squeezing my eyes shut. I'd never heard Hess speak this way before, so callously with none of the patient with none of the patience and kindness I was used to from him. I knew my life was worthless as a tunneler, but to hear him of all people speak of me like a belonging, the way the gang lieutenants speak spoke of me. Hey, it's all right. You can't take them too seriously. I nearly leapt leaped out of leapt out of my skin at the sound of the voice. A boy perched on top of Hess's desk, chin propped on his fist. He was only a few years older than me, dressed in the impeccable suit of a young aristocrat. But with a wry smile that belied his formal clothes, I'm Brant, he said, looking me right in the eye. Dark blonde hair thatched to his tawny face, hanging into his eyes without diminishing the, their intensity. I forced myself to look away. I'm not supposed to be talking to you. I shrank back from him, pressing against the wooden door. Bran hopped off the table and stepped toward me. He, with, he moved with an ease I could only dream of. Confident and unhurried. It's okay, I know all about you. Your secret's safe. S says you're an incredible dreamer. He held out one hand to me. Then he can barely keep up with you in the dream world. I started to reach for Brand's hand, then thought better of it, and pulled myself to my feet. You've been to Oneros too. Are you kidding? I'm no good at dreams. My skills lie elsewhere. Brand plucked a piece of parchment off as his desk and began folding it as he talked. I can lift the mustache right off a constable though, and persuade a banker to give away all his coins. You can't either, I said, crossing my arms. Brant smiled at me, lopsided. Well, maybe not, yet, but it's good to have dreams. He finished folding the blanket sheet, blank sheet into a paper sculpture of a lily. I scowled at him as he held it out to me. What are you doing here, I asked. We are going to work together, as it has told you. He's got big plans for you. I stared, something tightening in my gut. For me, but why? Because you're special. Brand tilted his head. There's no one else who can do what you do. I'm afraid you're mistaken. I backed toward the door, twisting the cleaning rag in my hands. I'm just a tunneler. And I have to get back underground. Brand took another step toward me. But what about your dreams? I froze. My dreams stirred inside me restless, unable to stretch their wings. I heard you have dreams of doing great deeds for the dreamer in Barstat. Brand said. I turned around to face him. Is it true? His expression softened, open, and warm. Because I don't dream like that, but I'd love to hear about them. For all his ease, the tunneler in me was suspicious. I didn't survive in the tunnels without suspicion in my bones. Why? What can you give me in exchange? He tilted his head. Well, I can show you what you need to know about the ministry. The ministry, I asked. But, then the door swung open and Professor S and another gentleman stormed into the office. Brant tensed, tensed, snapping to attention, like a soldier, but Hess went straight toward me and clutched me by both shoulders.
could be free of the gangs. As his face tightened as he studied me. Is that still what you want? I stared back, trying to reconcile the callous man I'd just overheard with the kindly S I'd always known. Which one was the truth? Of course it is. You'll have to work hard, he said. Not for the gangs, but for Barstad. For the dreamer himself. Are you willing to do that? My heart beat throbbed in my ears. Barstad was a land of growth, of achievement, of expansion. How could a malnourished little girl possibly embody those things? Yet the dreamer hinted at greatness for me. For all of Barstad, I am. Has nodded, glancing over his sh shoulder toward the other man. Good, good. Livia, this is Minister Durst from the Ministry of Affairs. He's going to purchase citizenship papers for you. I swayed backward. My papers, but I... My head spun. I felt my knees buckling beneath me. You mean I'm going to be free? I don't have to live in the tunnels any longer. Minister Durst pursed his lips. Not quite. The Ministry of Affairs will retain the papers. Perceive keeping. Until you're old enough to determine your own fate. But you'll be free of your master in the tunnels. And will take charge of your training along with us. He tucked at his coat lapels. It's quite an honor to work for the Ministry. And we are honored have someone with your potential. But what is the ministry, I asked. The minister turned toward us. I thought you ta taught her the most basic of. We are the emperor's secret police, Brand said. Words spilled from him eagerly. We keep tabs on the aristocrats and the gangs. Disrupt criminal activities, conduct spy work abroad. I mean, I haven't done any of that yet. We can learn together. Spy work. But if Hess thought I was clumsy, slow-witted, daft, I'm not sure I'm cut out to be a spy. Hess snorted. Don't be foolish, child. What you offer is somewhat different. Brand stepped forward. Anyone can be a spy, he said. But no one can use the dream world like you can. What you're going to do is something much better than basic spy work. No, I'm afraid you're all mistaken. I'm just a tunneler. And I really need to return. I looked down, face burning, and found the crumpled lily in my hand. As his grip eased on my shoulders. But Livia, you can be so much more. I'm going to teach you how.